We got another hint at a potential opponent for the men's basketball team next season. Plus, who doesn't love some mid-April bracketology? You are Locked On Hoosiers, your daily podcast on the Indiana Hoosiers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Hoosiers, your one and only daily one-stop shop for everything IU Athletics. I'm your host, as always, Jacob. want to thank you guys for making us your first listen, your first watch every single day. I see that love on YouTube. We are within probably about 20 subscribers, as I say this, of 1,000 subscribers Hit that subscribe button if you guys can. Let's get to a thousand. We're getting the we're getting there way quicker than I ever would imagine. So let's let's get past this. Can we do it by the end of the week? I would love it if we could. Let's look at IU's schedule. We got another little bit of a hint as to an, a, a potential opponent. I guess a potential set of opponents. We already know they're going to play two of UConn, Texas, Louisville. And Madison Square Garden. We know they're going to play Kansas. The Gavit games are kind of this thing that I. It, it's been rumored that it would. It's on its final years, and like it, there's always so many questions about it. I feel like you can never really nail down who's going to play in it, when it's going to be. Part of the problem is there's only 11 Big East teams, and there are 14 Big Ten teams. I just love that sentence. 14 teams in the Big Ten, uh, but. Nonetheless, we got a report from John Rothstein on Tuesday that the Gavit games were going to potentially feature all 11 Big East opponents for the first time. That's your other problem is that it doesn't even ever feature everybody. It's just kind of picking and choosing, and it's a mess. With the Big Ten ACC Challenge going away, expanding this into a whole conference thing would make sense even though, again, Big East can't match them in terms of numbers, but the very least you have 11 programs versus 11 programs. Like I said, uh, I believe this is the first time you would have all 11 teams competing. So what would that mean for Indiana in terms of potential opponents? Well, I can basically guarantee it's not going to be UConn because there, there's a good possibility they play UConn at Madison Square Garden doesn't mean that there aren't interesting uh, people, the Hoosiers, or teams the Hoosiers can play. If you look at last year's standings, Marquette won the conference uh, at 29 and 7, 17 and 3 in the conference. You could have the Tom Crean Bowl. Uh, I couldn't tell you the last time they played Marquette. I don't think they've played Marquette since, um, since hiring Tom Crean. I'll try to find that as I, I talk about this, but that would be obviously an interesting matchup you also have Creighton who's expected to be pretty good next season as well maybe the most intriguing matchup from a storyline perspective I don't know that it there's some questions about a competitiveness standpoint but St. John's with Rick Patino would be it would be interesting at the very least uh, IU did play Marquette. Uh, I actually might have been in the Gavit games looking at this uh, back in 2018, 2019. This game escaped my mind. I, I totally forgot about that. But that they did play that one time. I'm sure some of you were screaming that at me. It was a ranked Marquette team that IU just kind of shut down. I do vaguely remember this now. But um, maybe we get a, a, another matchup there. St. John's, like I said. Makes some sense. It's going to be interesting. I assume Purdue and UConn, if Zach Eady comes back, who he officially entered the NBA draft on Tuesday, but he's maintaining his college eligibility. Um, we'll see. He, he's kind of in the same boat that Trace Jackson Davis was last year, where if he gets drafted, it would be late second round. The problem with him is, I don't really see a whole lot of ways that his draft stock is going to change. Um, he's just kind of is who he is. 
He's not going to step out and add a three-pointer. He's not going to get more mobile. Maybe that impacts his decision. Maybe Purdue can put together a pretty big bag and throw it his way with NIL money that impacts his decision. We talked about that last year with guys like Trace, Armando Baycott, um, Drew Timmy, all those guys, that Hunter Dickinson, that were coming back and getting NIL money because it was just as profitable to stay in school versus risking not being drafted in the NBA and playing in the G League for less money. They if they were if they don't get drafted or if they're a second round pick and a late second round pick and are playing in the G League, um you're there's a good chance you're making less money, especially for someone like Edie. So don't be surprised if he returns, but also I think there's an intriguing case for him to just kind of cash in now and give it give the NBA his best shot. But I assume Purdue UConn's going to be the highlight game of the Gavit games. UConn's going to get a shot at <laughs> there's a there's a good chance UConn gets a shot at IU and Purdue within probably a couple weeks or a week of each other, uh, which would be fun. UConn might own the state of Indiana after that one. I'm not sure who I'd want the Hoosiers to play in this one. Um, personally, I just want whoever is going to be the best team. Like I, I just want to play the best opponents, which I assume will probably be Creighton. Uh, Marquette will be up there, but I assume Creighton's probably the non-UConn favorite uh, among those teams, unless I'm just uh, forgetting someone. Marquette, Creighton, either one of those is fine. I worry that we get St. John's. It will probably be a home game. I'm, I would imagine the Big Ten would push for that because we went to Xavier as part of the Gavit games last year. So I would imagine it'd be a home game, whoever it would be. It's going to be a fun environment. So uh, we'll see how that one plays out. But another potential opponent and probably a pretty good one for the Hoosiers. Mike Woodson wants this schedule to be tougher he spoke about that before. He's going out there and doing what he can to do that with the Yukon, Texas, uh, Louisville, unfortunately, uh, part of the – I'm blanking on the name, but the the kind of mini tournament they're playing in Madison Square Garden, scheduling Kansas, the Arizona game last year. He's clearly making an effort. It'll be interesting how they approach it this season because last year they were expecting like great things and – I mean, they had hopes of title contention, so they beefed up the schedule in that regard. This season, there's going to be a feeling out process that's required. Maybe you just throw guys in the deep, get them in these big games, learn about them that way, and try to get your best ball by March, April. There's a couple approaches they could take, but we'll see what one the Hoosiers end up choosing. But there'll be some marquee games on there at the very least. Let's talk bracketology. I know it's mid-April, but honestly, with the transfer portal as quiet as it is, there's nothing else to really get caught up on. So let's look at bracketology. ESPN re released men's and women's bracketology on Tuesday. The Hoosiers are in both, but on two very different sides uh, when it comes to one being very high-ranked, one barely being in the tournament. I'm assuming you can guess which one's it, which we'll dive into that here in a moment. Want to talk about FanDuel first though. Grand slams, no hitters and double plays are back. There is no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel America's number one sports book. That's because right now new customers can step up to the plate with a no sweat first bet up to a thousand dollars. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up, place your first bet and get up to $1,000 in bonus bets. If you do not win, on top of baseball, NBA playoffs are going on basically every, not basically, every night right now. Tons of action you guys can bet on over there. Don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. When you join FanDuel today, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Shout out to all of you guys again for making us your first listen every day. Every dayers, look, whenever the, there is going to be transfer news, we will talk about it. I know I said we talk about Grace Berger today. Uh, I wanted to try to get caught up on a couple of these, couple of news, couple of things I wanted to talk about. We'll have plenty of time to do season recaps once the transfer portal shuts and we head into the summer. So 
we'll have time for that. And we may end up doing that tomorrow if the transfer portal stays very quiet. We're going to talk about the transfer portal and the need for some of y'all to have some patience. We'll do that in a bit. Let's talk about uh, bracketology. 2024 bracketology. Yeah, uh, it, it was weird to see on um, ESPN, but hey, I, everybody loves it. Like we're here talking about it. Let's do the men's side first because we were just talking about the men's team. I was using the bracketology to look at who is supposed to be good in the Big East this year. Marquette is one of the one seeds with UConn. So Marquette, Creighton is a three seed. Those two teams probably are who I'd want IU to face in the Gavit games. Uh, St. John's, I don't believe, is even listed. They have a ton of question marks. Um, so that would be purely like a storyline game. I I don't care much for that. I'd rather play good teams and get better than play a storyline that none of the players really care about. Uh, IU though, in this bracketology is an 11 seed. They are one of the last four buys quite the fall from last year. Honestly though, fair. Um, we don't really even know what IU is going to look like. That's why these bracketologies are kind of silly during the transfer portal. This is a very incomplete IU team. I'm not even sure I could tell you a starting five right now. Uh, Xavier Johnson, Trey Galloway, CJ Gunn, uh, Malik Renu, and Kalel Ware. I'm, I probably am just spacing on somebody, but like there's some pretty noticeable holes. Maybe you, you start Gabe Cups right now, but eyes and done. They're not just going to head into the season with three open roster spots. So, or scholarship spots, I should say. So, like there's still a lot to be determined, which is why it's kind of pointless to to a certain degree to look at this but it gives you a look at some of the top teams the, these bracketologies aren't for the IUs these are for the Yukons the Marquettes the Dukes the Michigan States the teams that are those are your number one seeds the teams that know what they are Michigan State's going to be really damn good next season probably the favorite in the Big 10 even if Purdue brings Zach Eady back uh they are just kind of bringing back everybody from the team last season, which is rare uh, when it went in the modern era of college basketball. So this would have IU as an 11 seed against North Carolina, a six seed Florida Atlantic is in the three 14 matchup against Northern or excuse me, Eastern Kentucky. So maybe an IU dusty may game that would, uh, I mean, if we're talking about headlines, that would be a headline. Look, I don't know how interested they are in it, but like bring Florida Atlantic into Assembly Hall. That'd be a fun game. Florida Atlantic's going to be really good next season. It would be a cool moment for Dusty May to get to to play or coach his team in Assembly Hall. Why not? I I, I mean, I don't know if Florida Atlantic wants to come to Assembly Hall, but why not? I, I guess we should – like the Kentucky game might actually – be happening this year too or maybe next season that's obviously on the docket as well uh that was very much a topic before the season and like into the early part of the season but just entirely went away kentucky's a six seed in this bracketology so um we'll see maybe i use playing them this season as well i don't really know what happened to the kentucky discussions um they could come back i assume they were just put on hold because of the season and They'll revisit them this summer once recruiting has slowed down a little bit. So we'll see about that as well. Let's flip to the women's side. Uh, a lot of usual suspects when it comes to women's bracketology. Your number one seeds are UConn, who, if healthy, are probably the number one overall seed next year. LSU, defending champions, bring back Angel Reese. Utah, who was one of the best teams in the country this season and was in an argument for the last one seed. And Iowa, who has a really big hole in Monica Sinano to replace, but obviously they have Caitlin Clark. Indiana comes in as a two seed. They would be in the Utah region. Uh, they would be going to Portland as a, obviously as like the, the regional, the two regionals this season or next season, I should say, are Al Albany and Portland. They were Charleston and... Uh, Seattle, I think, this past year. So 
they're kind of one very East Coast, one very West Coast. It doesn't favor someone quite as much. I mean, that's a UConn home game, but I mean, we literally played UConn in a home game in the tournament before. So the NCAA loves nothing more than handing that to them. Uh, IU would play Vermont while NC State and Mississippi State would be the 7-10 matchup. It would be in Utah's region. Um, the Ole Miss is the three seed. Texas is the four seed. Florida State, five. UNC, six. There's not a whole lot in the way of storylines in this one. I, You know what I want in the tournament is Miami again, <laughs> but uh, Miami isn't even in the tournament. The Cavender Twins aren't coming back. They aren't even playing basketball. They might be going to WWE. That's not even a joke. Like that was a story, a headline. They're signed to an NIL deal with WWE, and that might be a thing. I okay, fair enough. That's not a path I thought they would have taken. But I want Miami again. Hopefully, they make it so I you can get some revenge because that one's gonna hurt for. A really long time, but again, this is a incomplete IU team. They have a lot of roster or scholarship spots. I keep saying roster spots, scholarship spots open. There's going to be some movement on that front eventually, <laughs> um, but we'll see. We obviously, if you guys want to go back and look, we talked about the possibility of Haley Van Lith coming to IU. She was on campus reportedly at LSU this uh, or. This week, it might have been on Tuesday, actually, specifically. Uh, I, that might be done and dusted for IU. LSU has a hole at point guard. She's going to want to go to somewhere that is going to be a a title contender, and we just said LSU's a one seed. So, I, look, if you lose out a recruiting battle for Haley Van Lith to LSU, like, fair play. I, IU shouldn't have, like, I don't want to say choked, but they shouldn't have been upset in the – second round if you were the team that made it to the final four maybe you're more in, enticing to a type of player but nonetheless iu is going to do damage in the transfer portal they will get people to come in they have some uh players coming in two really good players recruits coming in iu is going to be fine next season and as evidenced by being a number two seed in bracketology Let's talk about the transfer portal. We've hinted at it. Had a really interesting comment, and I mean that sarcastically. Um, on a video from this week, I want to talk about that and use that as a talking point for why everybody needs to calm the hell down about the transfer portal. We'll do that here in just a moment. So I had a comment, as I said, on one of the videos this week. I'm not going to put the person on blast. I'm not even going to tell you what video it is. It just got me thinking about this whole transfer portal and, and things like that. I mean, the commenter couldn't even spell Jalen Hood Shafino's name right, and he played an entire season at IU. Like, if you're not even going to get to that point, like, don't criticize, like, learn how to spell the name of the dude that dropped 35 on Purdue. I feel like he earned that much at least, but the gist of the comment was that Mike Woodson could not recruit. The coaching staff was doing an atrocious job at recruiting and they were getting lapped in the transfer portal. Um, there was a lot of things that you just had to overlook that they wrote off except for Jalen hood, Shafina, whose name was spelled wrong, which you can't say except that. Mike Woodson hasn't had a ton of time to recruit. He kind of had a little bit of time when he was first hired, and he got to Mar Bates. And look, getting that that commitment, you don't just write it off just because Tamar Bates didn't pan out. You get guys all the time that don't pan out. Uh, he's still laying at a five star recruit. Like that doesn't you don't just swipe that uh, away. He got Jalen Hood Shafino. He got Malik Renu, who just wasn't even mentioned. Malik Renu is, I think, positioned to have a really big season next year. They the the commenter said uh, you can't count Kalel Ware because he has energy concerns dating back to high school. Again, if your argument is to not count the lottery pick that IU got, not count the five star recruit IU got and not count the number two player in the transfer portal that IU got, then yeah, I guess Mike Woodson probably can't recruit if you're taking away 
every win he has, as well as ignoring Malik Renu, who was a top 30 recruit that IU got and had a strong freshman season. It's a dishonest criticism. But what I, I wanted to discuss about it is the need for some patience, guys. I know it's exciting the transfer portal is, and you guys have been crushing it on in terms of like watching the videos. I'm enjoying the idea of kind of thinking about some of these guys as uh, players on the team next season. That's fun. Also, we're not even like beginning to get into the transfer portal. Players can still enter the portal until May 11th. It's April 19th. That's three more weeks that players can even enter the portal. We're a long way away from this being done. There are going to be impact names that still enter the portal. Patience. And as we, I mean, we clearly have seen things happen behind the scenes that we're not even aware of, which I think is the biggest thing people need to accept. Except that you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> like, Kalel Ware went from not on IU's radar to, oh my God, he's going to commit in like 72 hours, maybe a little bit more than that. Nobody thought he Kalel Ware was someone IU was going after, and then he was being recruited. He was on campus. He had a hell of a visit. People thought he was going to commit before the visit was even over, and he needed a couple more days and did so. That all happened inside of a week. That happened in like four days total. Patience. Things change very rapidly. Other people committing to places shifts the landscape. The idea that I I use getting lapped in the portal by who? Um, no, it's not like anybody's out there just gathering up all the recruits and nobody else is doing it. And it's not even like even if it was, it's not a rival. It's not like Purdue is just getting all these recruits. Purdue has their own concerns about. Uh, the recruit that could be decommitting. I'm not even going to dive into that because that's all rumors right now, but it would, it'll be a discussion if he does decommit. Um, everybody's going through this guys. I think the end of the day, this is what college basketball is now. Accept it. Know that at the end of every season, there's going to be a couple weeks, a month of uncertainty as you navigate putting together a roster again. That's what, should happen players should have the ability to move i if you look at tamar bates he did nothing wrong in terms of his approach at indiana it just wasn't the right fit things didn't work out he can go to missouri now and have another shot i am fully in support of that i don't know why you wouldn't be in support of that that's the types of situations that i think players are entitled there's some thousand names still in the portal patience. I I know I'm speaking to a vocal minority and a lot of you do have patience, but I just have found it a little silly. Some of the overreacting to the portal, calm down guys. <laughs> um, it'll, we're, we'll get there. It'll be fine. If you don't trust Mike Woodson at this point, I don't know based on what he's done great at recruiting and he's put together a winner on the floor. If you don't trust him, then you just don't, you're just like ignoring facts. So we'll get there. And when we do get there, when we get these commitments, we will be here at Locked on Hoosiers to let you guys know all about them. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. Every day is tomorrow on the show. I, I'll i commit to it now. If there's no uh, recruitment news or transfer portal news, we will talk about Grace Berger and what she meant, the legacy she leaves behind for the women's basketball program. Excited to see her with the fever next year. So follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Hoosiers. Subscribe to the podcast. Leave a rating and review. All that great stuff. I've seen the ratings, the recent ratings. I, I thank you guys for those of you that listen daily or nightly at work. I know, I know it was the latest review that you listen each night at work. Thank you. I appreciate all of you that continue to support us. As always, guys, I hope everybody has a terrific Wednesday. And most importantly, LEO.